you. So hello everybody and welcome to Potentialization. Today we've got John Lee with us from Darsbury Innovation Centre and we're going to be talking about collaboration, networking and partnerships. Uh, of course, Darsbury is one of the UK's leading science parks in this country, so thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure, John. Great, great to have you here. Uh, first thing I should do is apologise, it's very hot. <laughs> It's probably the hottest day in the UK we've had for a long time, isn't it? So uh, apologies, it's a bit warmer if, we, if we're struggling at all. So to get started, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about your background and sure. maybe lead that through into how that led to you getting to Desmond. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be uh, with you uh, this evening. So uh, John, thanks very much indeed for the, the invitation. And uh, yeah, delighted to kind of get connected into your sort of wider group and network. So, I mean, I, I started my life out as a chemical engineer. That's what I, I did as, a, as my uh, training and education at the University of Birmingham. And uh, uh, took a year out after that, actually helping to run the Students' Union down at the, uh, the university there, and then uh, went on to a career in Unilever. So I've got a job as a process engineer in Unilever, uh, moved up to Port Sunlight and worked actually at the the Lever Brothers facility uh, rather than Unilever Research for those people who live in the Northwest. And when you talk about Port Sunlight, they assume it was Unilever Research. Um, so did that for uh, just over a year and realized fairly quickly that my long-term career path was not going to be as an engineer. Um, it, it, was, it was okay, but I had sort of a passion aspirations really to move into <clears throat> more sales and marketing but focus around sort of uh, technical uh, uh, products and technical services. So I then moved uh, after just over a year to another part of Unilever, uh, which was a company called Crossfield. Uh, and they were essentially manufacturers and suppliers of inorganic chemicals to a whole variety of different industries all around the world. And I spent the next 15 years um, at, at Crossfield, uh, which was based in Warrington. That's where the headquarters was. Um, uh, moving into uh, different roles, selling silica products into everything from the edible oils industry. I spent uh, four years in, in North America uh, working at our Chicago base, selling into the brewing industry. The world's best job, by the way, is selling into anything into the North American brewing industry. I think it's probably one of the few jobs where you do your market research in the bar uh, rather than anywhere else. Um, so I had a fantastic time doing that. Came back to the UK picked up a global business management role, uh, selling into the personal care industry. So I uh, went from working for Unilever to selling to Unilever. And during that time, our business had got sold on to ICI, got sold on to Ineos. Um, so I spent, you know, say a, a large part of my time was um, in the chemicals industry, selling, to, selling products uh, all around the world, technical products. And um, got quite used as part of that to also managing large key accounts. So Unilever was, uh, was one of my customers. It was a sort of 15 million euro account selling to locations all, all over the world, uh, mainly into toothpaste, but also into some of their personal care products as well. So fun job, enjoyed it, but got to the stage where um, I, I suppose I'd done it for 15 years and was looking for something new, something uh, a new challenge. So you might describe SciTech Darsby as my midlife crisis, um, but just decided I want to go and do something completely different. And, you know, as often happens when you're kind of building up networks and connections, you have a conversation with somebody and that leads on to something else. And that was the same for me. I applied for a, for a job um, and got to know a particular headhunter, a guy called Steve Bennett. And we kept in touch, met up every so often just to kind of talk what was going on, um, uh, see where I was in terms of kind of my, my career path. And I met up one time with Steve and he said, I think I've got the perfect job for you. And that job basically was at SciTech Darsbury at the time. It had been a government research facility for sort of 40 plus years. And they decided they were going to change what uh, the, the Darsbury site was about and develop this science and innovation campus. And they needed somebody to kind of lead on the development of that, uh, to work on bringing companies in there. A colleague of mine, Paul Trelaw, had already been involved in that for a couple of years, but it was kind of taking it on to the next stage in terms of establishing a business team and developing a long-term strategy. 
um, about how we were going to develop the campus from nothing to something that would employ 10,000 people. Um, so that was 2006. Uh, I've been there ever since. Uh, in 2000, end of 2010, we set up a public-private joint venture, which is what we had intended to do, and that's been in operation ever since uh, with a company called Langtree, who I, who I now work for, um, but based uh, completely at Science Technology. And I'll say our mission was about developing this science and innovation campus, and I guess with some of the kind of founding principles about how we wanted to work the campus. So Paul Trelaw, my colleague, had come from a high-tech SME background. He'd been involved, actually had been a tenant on a science park, had seen some of the good and the bad and the ugly about sort of the support for uh, high-tech companies, things that worked and things that didn't work, and wanted to do something where actually we could do it differently and we could do it better in terms of how we supported companies. So in terms of our sort of aspirations, one was about basing it on open innovation. Open innovation at that time was a relatively new concept developed by Henry Cheeseborough at Berkeley University in the States. Uh, and the idea being that actually you looked outside your organization as much for the skills and the expertise and the capabilities that you would need to successfully develop your business uh, as much as it was within your business. So kind of you know, with that in mind, then that required us to be looking at a whole variety of different collaborations and partnerships that could help deliver what we needed to deliver to our companies, which was essentially enabling them to add where they often had very deep expertise, but narrow expertise, and actually adding to that in terms of uh, capabilities that sat either from other organizations on our site or other organizations in the network that we had to develop. Um, so if you look at where we are today, 2021, there's now, I think, 1,500 people, 1,600 people working on the site uh, from a standing start of about 400. There's uh, nearly 150 companies there. Probably 20% of them are from uh, outside the UK. Um, they include large giants like uh, IBM and Hitachi, and they include entrepreneurs, who are starting up their first business uh, and, and everything in between. Um, I'm just asking anyway, that's a, kind of a useful starting point. Yeah, that, that, that's really useful. I noticed it when we both talked, and I'll have to pause because we're getting a bit of interference. But w when you were applying for that job, was that one of the key things? Because your background was obviously outright engineer and then a complete switch. Yeah, well, I, I suppose. That it would, it, over the previous sort of 10 plus years, I'd been involved in sales, marketing and business development. So a lot of that was about um, developing strategic relationships with key accounts. I mean, that was Unilever on one side, it was people like Anheuser-Busch, <coughs> excuse me, Budweiser and another. And in terms of key account management, you're having to understand that organization. You're having to do a lot of um, navigation around it to understand how decisions are taken. Uh, who are the people that you need to influence, who are the gatekeepers and so on. So in a, in a sense, kind of that, those sort of skills that I developed, it was applying it to where we were going to work with organizations that we needed to partner with. Some of them that were large corporates, some of them were large universities, uh, some of them were government organizations. You know, at the time when I moved to, uh, to Dartry, I was employed by the Northwest Regional Development Agency. It was a regional government organization. So quite specific characters and cultures and ways of doing things that you basically had to learn and, and as I say, navigate your way around those types of organizations to know how to get things done. So how important was it? Because obviously <laughs> as a business development manager, it was all those skills you'd got later <clears throat> on in your career. But how important was it that you'd got that technical background that you um, actually understand some, what, what, a little bit of what the companies were actually doing or? Uh, as, I would say, I mean, my, my technical background was in engineering, was in materials. <clears throat> These days I deal, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> These days, you know, I'm dealing a, 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 with a lot of digital companies. I've never worked in a digital company. Um, so you have to learn. Uh, I suppose you've got to learn, uh, you know, you've got to learn enough and ask the right questions to know how you can best help those companies. But I don't have to be an expert, and it's impossible to be an expert in anything from a, you know, an artificial intelligence uh, company yeah. through yeah. to uh, 
you know, one which is involved in um, biotechnology through to clean technology companies. You know, you can't be experts in all of those. Yeah. The key yeah. thing is actually knowing, and I suppose that's part of developing a network, is to make sure that you've got people who are experts and who can help. Um, and you just find out who those people are and look to see how you can engage them and bring them into the, the community that we've been developing. Yeah, I'm thinking perhaps in a more general sense, of course, because obviously you can't be an expert in all of those things, but at least you've got a, a technical mind that you can engage with those people and have those conversations and kind of be a link. I mean, the reason I'm asking partly is because potentialization in our system is all about understanding ourselves, what we're good yeah. at, what our strengths are. And it seems to me perhaps you've got two distinct strengths there, that you've got a technical mind, but also you've kind of bridged into that market, marketing, sales, organization yeah. stuff, et cetera. Just, just to, to ask briefly, and I don't know, I wonder if you've thought about this even, that you started off as an engineer, and at some point it became obvious. But I wonder why, if you've got any thoughts about why that happens sometimes. Why do people start out in one path from your own perspective and then it changes? I suppose part of it is probably to do with education. I mean, you get channeled in a certain direction. When I was at school, hey, guess what? You couldn't study business. It, that as a subject at GCSE or A-level didn't exist. I've had both of my sons um, have studied that at school. Um, and I've actually, well, one's again gone into a sales and marketing career and the other's about to hopefully study business economics at, at university. When I went, you know, you, there was a much more limited selection of, of uh, subjects to do. You know, I was a kind of a mathematician and a scientist, absolutely loved those subjects. So I studied maths, physics and chemistry for A-level. So it was either going into a, I'm going to study one of those subjects um, at university or going into something like engineering. That was kind of a natural choice. I particularly like chemistry. So I was probably always going to do either chemistry or chemical engineering. Chemical engineering just seemed to be the best mix of those three subjects. Yeah, <clears throat> in a sense, you, you've beaten me to it. I did maths, physics, and chemistry as well, okay. going back several years. And in fact, it, it was perhaps the maths and physics led me to software. And I've had a career in software, but actually I've also had this passion of networking and, and all those other things as well. But it took me until just six months ago when I've actually formally brought that in, whereas you, you've obviously found your strength much earlier. So... Tonight we're talking about partnerships, collaborations, and those kind of things. So obviously you've been working, so as well as collaborations between the different parties and the different companies that are there, obviously as part of the core of it as well, you say it's actually been involved in setting Daresbury up and everything. So what is it that makes a good partnership in, in your experience? Yeah, I was kind of reflecting on that. And I, and I suppose part, you know, a good partnership will typically have a sort of long-term view about what that partnership will mean to both parties. Um, there's certainly got to be, um, there has to be a, a, a need on both sides where actually they take the time to get to know each other, understand each other, understand about the culture, the aims and the aspirations. Um, you know, it's, a, it's not quite a marriage, but it's kind of along those lines where actually if you don't invest that time up front, then at some point, point something's going to happen which could uh, threaten that partnership um, I think flexibility okay. is also that you know if you're looking at kind of successful long-term partnerships there are going to be changes within the organizations uh, on, on both sides so it's kind of um, being able to kind of uh, morph that partnership in response to actually either what might be happening on a kind of macroeconomic basis or what might be happening within those individual organizations, changes in strategy, changes in leadership, um, uh, and being able to kind of adapt and flex uh, the sort of uh, objectives and aspirations for that partnership as you go along. Do you think that that's changed over the years? Because we, we, in, in business, it's competitive. People have got to make a profit, they've got competitors, uh, that sometimes organizations work with other companies that are competitors in some areas, but they've got areas of interest. It, has it changed over the years? Do companies tend to trust more now, be more open to collaborations? I think it's probably more accepted now, you know, mm -hmm. I say on, on the back of kind of um, 
the work of people like Henry Cheeseman talking about open innovation, where actually organizations, uh, particularly large organizations, have changed their whole strategy. If you look at what's happened, for example, in the pharmaceutical sector, you know, where they've massively moved away from doing a lot of the very early stage biotech research and saying, well, actually, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to work with more agile um, organizations who actually are probably better at doing those early stages. And actually, we will then engage with those organizations to look at taking the sort of the, the, the best of those developments and then bringing that through our sort of regulatory um, clinical trial process uh, commercialization uh, and then taking the, uh, the value and the benefits out through that process. So um, I think what you've seen is more organizations across a variety of sectors saying, actually, do you know what? We don't have to be doing all of this um, uh, it, within our own uh, within our own organization somebody used the, the the great phrase is it's moving from like the the lab is our world to the world is our lab that actually out there there's people doing fantastic things and it's just about how can we more effectively engage with that so again you've seen organizations actually starting to kind of formalize and professionalize a lot of their open innovation and collaboration activities which they probably weren't doing uh, probably well, certainly when I started my working life in Unilever, you know, collaborations, well, partnerships took place, but there were probably much more arm's length, much more formal partnerships. Um, and it wasn't, it was seen probably some much more tactical rather than strategic. So if you, if you're looking at a question. Oh, can I ask a question, John? Or is it... Go on, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. And um, collaboration is a high level idea. Um, so what's changed in the thinking of the organization to move away from this it's us and them kind of perspective to actually it's we yeah and I, and I guess part of it is that you, you know as always you get some early movers in that kind of world of open innovation and uh, as long as that is successful then people start to say do you know what uh, let's follow and either that's driven by um, costs or it's driven by effectiveness in terms of people saying, well, actually, maybe that is a more effective way of doing it. And I, and I guess also the other thing is that we're probably living in a world that is where technology is progressing at a rapidly accelerating pace. So the ability for larger organizations to, affect, to invest in you know, significant research uh, activities and organizations and know that those will continue to deliver value over a long period of time it's probably not necessarily true because actually, you know, technology will rapidly change and move on. And suddenly you've got to be experts in areas that you, you know, a few years before never even existed. Um, and large corporate organizations don't tend to be particularly effective at that, at being able to kind of move at that sort of pace. So I guess it's almost kind of like a, a natural reaction from the markets, probably driven initially through some of the larger corporate organizations, you know, kind of the, uh, the sort of Unilever, as I talked about, Big Pharma, people like that, you know, adapting the way they were doing things. And then suddenly that starts to have an impact across, across uh, other sectors and across businesses, large and small. Yeah, I suppose that it's really important that if we're working and collaborating with people that we trust them to some extent. But is that enough? Do we need to like the people that we're working with? Um, I suppose it always helps. Uh, nobody really likes to collaborate with people they don't like. Life's a bit too short. Um, so I suppose you don't have to like them. Um, trust them, absolutely. I think, you know, I can't see how you can have a successful partnership if that's with somebody that you don't really trust. It's, you know, that's never going to last very long. Um, I guess the other thing is also that probably you need to have respect for your partner. There's got to be something about what they know or their capabilities or the facilities that is something that actually um, that you respect, that you know is going to add value to the things that you want to do. Uh, but, um, you know, I say you don't necessarily have to like, like the people that you're working with, but I think certainly you've got to trust them and respect them. I suppose uh, taking that a little bit further, if you've got a good working relationship and people do actually like each other and start to talk to each other individually, is, is it good to mix teams up? I suppose 
or, or, or are you better to try and keep the identities of the separate partners separate? I suppose it depends on kind of what your objectives are from yeah. from that partnership. Um, you know, I think there's huge value in terms of kind of mixing cultures, ways of thinking between different organisations. You know, that you know one can benefit from absorbing some of the the ways that the other organisation will will approach problems, will uh, 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 rationalise through the uh, the issues they need to be tackling, and even just the culture about how they interface with other people within their own organisation. How do they work with them? How do they uh, get the best out of each other? So, um, you know, we're often a product of our own culture. You know, if you've ever gone and lived abroad, you some you don't realise actually how embedded you are as, as uh, somebody that's from from your particular country, even if even if you never really identified as, as that, you might not think of yourself in that way. Suddenly you go to another culture and you realize actually that people think, behave, talk and do things in a very different way to you um, because they are a product of where they were brought up. And, that, and that's absolutely the same in the organization that you work in. And I think from a psychology point of view, people have very different views of the world. And that's, I think that's one of the issues why when you buy, get a big company buying up small ones, they've got very different ways of looking at the yeah. world and that, that can cause friction. So Yeah, they can be quite un incompatible really with each yeah. other. So, well, I was teaching exactly that this morning on, uh, on my master's course. I was teaching co uh, acquisitions and takeovers and things like that. And I always ask the students if they are aware enough of their culture to step out of it so that it doesn't impact how they think how they construct themselves. Are you aware enough of your culture to step out so it doesn't impact your thinking? And, and, I, and I say, I spent four years living in the States and, and that was quite an eye opener because that did make me realize about how much I was a product of my culture when, I, when you're surrounded by people who actually are, <laughs> I say, behaving, behaving and, uh, and, and thinking and talking in quite a different way to you. Um, and I think it's a good, you know, so personally, it was a great experience in terms of kind of suddenly realizing, okay, people are going to look at things in quite a different way to you. And it's, it's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily better, but it's different. And, and there are benefits, <laughs> maybe in the States, but anyway, that's, a, that's, a, that's another thing. But, you know, yeah. there's something to learn from that because actually uh, they will just be looking at the world in quite a different way to you. Uh, and there's always something to learn from that. So even if you're quite different, it doesn't rule out collaboration, different cultures, different ideas or different personalities. But, but what are the things that actually make a good collaborator, either individually or as an organizer? Are there key things that need to be there? Um, I, I'm, I always thought that a good collaborator has to be a good listener. Um, uh, and I say listening in, in all aspects, you know, in terms of kind of um, their emotional intelligence in terms of understanding about how people behave, um, what they're thinking, you know, how they will uh, uh, behave in such, certain situations. Um, and I say, you know, always a good partnership, good collaboration is, is about um, understanding the needs and the aspirations and the objectives of the organisation, which are of, often multifarious, quite complex depending on who you're talking to within those organizations and often the size of those organizations. So somebody has got the ability to kind of absorb all of that and sort of piece it together into a larger board to understand um, that organization and how it's going to think and how it's going to behave, I think is, is you know, a, a huge skill um, that not everybody has. Um, so I think those, those are some of the things. And, and I say adaptability, I think, you know, that, um, that you might have to kind of uh, be able to flex your objectives and your strategy in response to changes that are taking place within that particular organization. I say, you know, a long-term partnership is good. in all probability, will go through some sort of financial crisis at some stage. Uh, it might go through a pandemic as we've just been through. So that's gonna have massive impacts in terms of how a partnership is gonna work. And to be a good collaborator, you've gotta be able to adapt to that take stock of the situation, the impact of that partner, and evolve a new strategy, a new way of working together to respond to that. Yeah, that, that leads me on to what the role of Darsbury is, that I wonder, 
I mean, because I was a software engineer. I was relatively quiet. I know going to the breakfast meeting sometimes, for me as somebody that would math, it's, I'm okay one to one talking to people, we've got a technical conversation, but walking into a room full of people is a challenge. So a lot of the small companies that you work with are going to be full of engineers that might be quiet like that as well. Do you help those small companies talk to other companies? How would you help them find perhaps the right collaborations or? Is that part of the role? Or? Yeah, totally. And, and, you know, when we're working with a company, we might be talking to them. So we had one that, that moved to SciTech Darsbury um, earlier this year. We started talking to them in 2012. Wow. So it's only taken nine years for them to decide to move to SciTech Darsbury. Yeah. But we've had, you know, numerous conversations and discussions. We've had uh, uh, connected them to numerous people over that period of time. So actually, you know, you take the time to understand the business, understand the, the individuals within the business, and bearing in mind that a lot of our companies uh, that move to SciTech Tarsbury are owner-managed businesses that are set up by a single entrepreneur or a group of entrepreneurs. So you're dealing with, with individuals who are very close to the, the, the particular businesses. So building up that understanding actually then enables us to sort of build up our intelligence about where that business is going, what are their particular needs at any point in time, and therefore who within our network, or who on campus, or within our wider network, could actually help them tackle the particular challenges and issues that they're, they're facing. And we typically have broken, you know, we, we break it down. That Generally the rule is if we're talking to any of our companies, they will have challenges in one of four areas, maybe more than one, but typically one, maybe two. Uh, and that's either about how do they get to market with their products or services? How do they raise the finance, the funding that they need? So we talk about routes to money. Um, how will they get access um, to the talent that they need? And that isn't just necessarily about recruiting, but is about the expertise that they need to successfully develop and grow the business and how do they get access to technical facilities that they might need. So it's typically in those four areas. And to say, we will be looking at the companies in a very bespoke way to say, okay, where are the challenges and therefore who within our network can actually help them overcome those challenges? That, in a simple way, is actually just about helping them de-risk their business. You're removing challenges, you're lowering the risk, therefore they are more likely to survive and they are more likely to grow their business at their highest potential rate. So I guess a question there would be, surely the government should be giving you even more money to help this process work even better. Um, yeah, I suppose, in, you know, you go back to kind of, is this about government intervention or which maybe in the early days it is, but actually if the model works, then you'd want it to be sustainable. Mm you kind of want to use government money to intervene in the right way. From my experience where we've had either UK or European government money, there are all sorts of, um, you know, uh, strings attached to it that actually in some cases it can slow you down. And therefore actually we've got something that's working and it is commercially sustainable. Fine, just let it run. Yes. I mean, that's interesting. There's actually a danger of taking grants or, or whatever it might be that would actually tie you down as a small company in a certain direction. So, yeah, you know, I think what you're saying is you need to be quite fluid in the way that you work with those companies. Yeah. 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 And, and, and from our perspective, in terms of kind of, um, I say, do we need to run all of the support programs that uh, our companies might need? Absolutely not. I mean, we haven't got the capacity, wouldn't have the expertise. What we do need to know is who's doing it and where and how might our companies access them. And with that knowledge then, and the intelligence about the needs of our companies, we can then make the connection. And I probably haven't and answered your earlier point, John, because you asked a question about kind of, well, how does it work if you've got people who are perhaps more introverted um, and not necessarily comfortable moving into a kind of a, a sort of highly dynamic kind of networking situation. A lot of our, connections and collaborations don't come from events. They've come from very, some very specific knowledge about one or more companies that warrants an introduction. And sometimes when you make those introductions, you don't know where they're going to lead. 
Mm. But often they can end up leading to very successful collaborations. But it's a, the key thing is having one enough knowledge and understanding about the companies, but also having a relationship of trust with the management team of those companies. So actually, when you knock on the door and say, "I think there's somebody that you really ought to meet," they don't think, you know, it's John again pestering me, wasting my time. Then actually, they think, you know what? If he's saying that that's the case. He knows enough about what we're trying to do that it's worthwhile spending the time. So this could actually be a quite a phone call, quick conversation, email, as opposed to putting those people that aren't the most natural networkers yeah. in a room full of people and letting them fight out for themselves. Yeah. So actually, it's a safe environment for them, I guess. Yeah, it is. And, that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'd say that I remember in our early days, we uh, and recruited a team of people, and one of the people we recruited was a... Um, it was a lady, uh, Stephanie, who was our finance manager. So she managed all of our accounts and all the rest of it. Um, when you kind of did sort of a, a Bryce Briggs, uh, Bryce Briggs analysis of uh, Stephanie, she was something like ninety percent, ninety-one percent on the introvert scale. Mm-hmm. So putting her into a highly dynamic networking environment was massively challenging for her, but she was able to do it. She would kind of usually have to go and spend the rest of the morning not having to talk to anybody, just to kind of like sort of get her energy levels back up back up because she was totally exhausted but you know i think i took from that is actually that if you create a safe environment and a facilitated environment that even people who aren't natural networkers can get benefit from it it's not impossible it's you know networking events are not just for the extroverts they're actually for all people and they can learn uh, better over time of course as, as they get to know people and trust etc so you you've seen lots of collaborations start lots of networking and lots of partnerships but they must go wrong sometimes what what, what is it that makes them break um well I, I i think one you know i mean well i suppose sometimes partnerships will just serve a purpose for a period of time so in some cases they actually will naturally come to an end and that's there's nothing wrong with that and in some cases actually a positive thing to do is to know when actually a partnership has run its course and it's time to call an end and there's nothing worse than continuing a partnership which actually then goes horribly wrong because actually it wasn't going to achieve what people were wanting to achieve and say often when i was thinking about this with collaborations and partnerships i suppose that they often can fall into two camps you can either have a, uh, a partnership where actually there's a common goal or actually where they where they have separate goals but those goals are compatible and i guess if you get to a stage where actually they don't actually sort of fit into either of those boxes, then it's probably time to call a halt to that partnership and move on. Yeah. Sorry, Darren. So it is like a marriage. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but I think the other thing is, you know, when, when do partnerships break is when one is you come back to the trust. If actually there's any point in time where actually particular actions or behavior has damage the trust between the two partners often that's pretty difficult to come back from because you're never going to be behaving in a an optimum manner with your partners you're always going to be holding something back you're always going to be questioning you're always going to be looking for evidence to either confirm that they're doing what you suspected they might be doing um, so, so would you say then that if you've got a partnership, and as Darren just said, in, in some ways it might be a bit like a marriage, that actually you forget to do the work to make the partnership work in the long term. Should organisations be reviewing and managing the, the relationship actively? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'd say, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, that actually I think the whole, the whole thing around collaboration and partnerships in business has now become kind of much more of a professional discipline that actually organizations should be looking at, you know, what is their active partnership strategy? Uh, and part of that goes to, you know, why would you do a partnership? Because it either enables you to do something faster because it's maybe giving you more capacity or a, a quicker way of doing something than doing it yourself, uh, or it's filling gaps in your own expertise. Um, that you've just decided for whatever reason you're not going to try and fill um, yourself. 
now as time goes on, of course, that might change. You might decide that actually, um, you know, having uh, AI expertise in your business that, you know, two years ago wasn't strategically important. The world's moved on and suddenly now, actually, if you don't have it within your business, then that's going to put you at a disadvantage to your competition. So suddenly the partnership that you had with that AI, AI company is no longer the right route forward. And you might buy them, I guess, and, and, and bring them into the business or actually you decide that you're going to set up your own team. So, you know, Sometimes, you know, the, the, the goals, the objectives are going to change and therefore your partnership strategy should adapt to reflect that change as well. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned AI there because, of course, that's disrupting the job market a lot. And, of course, you've got the Heart Tree Centre, which is one of the, I'm not even sure how to quantify it, but it's certainly one of the centres in the UK for AI yeah. in various ways. And, and you, I think you've got a few... Maybe Hard Tree is one of the, the gems, I guess, of the, the site. But you, you've got a few organisations doing some really cutting edge stuff there, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I say that's in you know partnership with the likes of IBM Research. Um, they've got links into Nvidia, Intel, uh, Atos, working with the universities and building a cluster of you know data science and, and AI companies around that as well, doing some really fantastic stuff. It might be worth just saying briefly then, because you've mentioned that you've got big companies like IBM, you mentioned universities. Uh, what, how, what are the relationships like with the universities? How much do you do with them? So, I mean, we have, um, I would say, partnerships. Some of them are very active uh, and formal strategic partnerships with some of the universities, like the University of Liverpool. But we uh, actively work with sort of the 10 main universities in the northwest because again we go back to if we look at kind of what what are the the needs where do we need to to, to help de-risk our companies access to talent well 75 percent of the people that work in our companies are graduate qualified or above so not surprisingly um being able to access graduate talent into our companies is is, is key to, to the businesses and secondly often companies in the process of uh, the creating their new products and services will be looking for partners to fill in gaps in terms of their either their capabilities or facilities that they need to do that. So often that is about R&D collaborations with universities. And I think something like, I'm going to say maybe sort of a quarter of our companies will have sort of active R&D collaborations with universities. Do you, do you ever talk to colleges as well, or do the university, I guess the universities do that all the time? So in terms of FE colleges? Yes. Um, historically, we a little bit, and, and I suppose that then ties into more of the apprenticeship agenda. Yeah. So historically, that hasn't, for our, for our companies, hasn't been that active, although I think we'll become increasingly active in the digital space. Well, one um, of the things I think you mentioned earlier was open innovation. Now, I don't know a huge amount about that, but... That sounds as if it's got collaboration partnerships involved in it. Do you want to tell us more about it? Well, I, I say, I mean, you, you can go and check it out. I think it was the the uh, idea of uh, Professor Henry Cheeseborough from Berkeley University back in something like 2003. So when we set up SciTech Darsby 2005, 2006, as a concept, it was still relatively new. But the whole idea was that, you know, you often talk about people as sort of the classic innovation funnel. You know, you start with a pipeline of lots of ideas and slowly but surely whittle those down to the ones that you then are taking to market. And the whole idea they had was that it was a, it was a, um, a leaky funnel. So there was all sorts of holes and gaps where stuff would actually go far, so far down the, fun, the funnel and then might actually, that might be licensed out to a third party, but actually had capabilities, expertise, products, services that would be coming into the, this sort of very porous funnel that actually would shape what you were eventually taking to, to market. And that was the whole concept. And so not surprisingly, collaborations and partnerships had to be at the heart of open innovation. Because it's essentially saying, you know, the, the smarts we're gonna need are more likely to sit outside our organization than inside our organization. I'm still a little curious, because as a software engineer from my background, I think open source is that, in, in terms of sharing much more or, or 
all those kind of things. So, yeah, and I suppose that you know whether that came on the the back of open innovation, I'm not I'm not sure, but I, but I guess that's kind of part of the world saying, you know what, we've got some um, you know smart uh, capability, smart technologies here, but actually, in order for that to be really properly utilised around the world, then the last the worst thing we can possibly do is protect it. Um, uh, make it more difficult to get hold of, set, you know, embroil it around it, sort of commercial relationships and terms and conditions. If we kind of make it open source, then people can go away and again further innovate on the back of it. I suppose that kind of raises a question. Oh, Darren, going to ask? Yeah, no, that was my point earlier about um, higher level collaboration, higher level thinking, because Elon Musk did something similar, didn't he? And I'm trying to rack my brain for it but he they, he essentially said in fact we could use volvo and when they invented the seatbelt and they left the patent open and said look it's going to save lives we'd yeah. rather save more lives than um make a couple of quid or, or whatever yeah <laughs> that's the kind of collaborative the the open source ideas they the higher level for the good of everybody in mankind yeah. kind of principles yeah, well, it's kind of, it's completely community driven, isn't it? It's kind of saying, look, actually, we're a part of a community. If we put this into the community, I, 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 one of my comments I had is that, you know, good collaborations are all about paying it forward. That sometimes you do things, not because you're going to get anything back at that point in time, but you know, if you do that, if, if you pay it forward, then other people will follow, will, you know, similar behavior. And actually you will benefit at some point in time. Um, because there'll be things that will come back to you that actually will benefit you, that will be the right thing you need at that point in time. Um, and that's obviously, you know, obviously about how those open source communities work. I suppose that's an interesting balance because small companies, obviously part of the service you provide, I know you introduce people to lawyers that can provide IP and protect that, because it's really important when you're starting up that you might put a lot of your life into creating some new inventions or devices and it's with a view to having a career and making some money off the back of it but of course we don't want to shut the world down completely and everybody protect everything so do you, do you ever see that balance playing out at all in terms of companies and how much some, they give away um i, th I suppose part of what, sometimes one of the biggest challenges that we have with uh, with an entrepreneur is where there is a real lack of trust yeah and therefore they've got an idea they may well have patented it maybe they're in the process of putting the the ip protection around it but actually they are reluctant to go and talk about it with anybody without you know an nda being in place at the very least if not something more than that and then you're in a situation where actually the idea can never get out because often you've got to just take a decision about how much are you willing to share with somebody in order that you can start that conversation about what they might have that can help you really develop the final product, the final solution to meet the needs of the market. Um, so with those types of companies, it, you, you often see that the business never gets off the ground because actually if you aren't willing to share uh, and uh, openly discuss what you're doing, with other parties for further input, advice, guidance, then you probably never, you know, you're probably never going to develop the product or the solution that is going to be needed by the marketplace. You won't, you'll never get that. Have you actually ever had that conversation with somebody that obviously this trust is an issue? Is yeah. it something you can help people with? Yeah, and, and I say part of that, and in some cases, you know, our starting point. Uh, and, and often it's because people have heard horror stories about, you know, somebody's IP being stolen, you know, uh, by some cases a fellow director, in other cases by a company that they thought they had a confidentiality agreement in place with, but they were bigger and uglier. And if you wanted to take them to court, then go ahead and make their day. And, and often if you're a small business, you just like you can't afford to do that. So people will hear the horror stories. That's what, you know, certainly protect what you've got and take sensible steps to do that, whether that's through IP protection, whether that's through insurance protection or whatever, mm -hmm. and make sure you've got the right agreements in place to do the sensible things. Um, but actually don't let that become 
a hindrance to you actually even going and having conversations with people who either might be your customers or might be kind of collaborators or co-innovators with you, uh, because you'll, you'll never be successful. I guess what's important to this is that what often, what, well, some people might say always carries a new idea forward, is not just the idea, it's the passion of the person that's created it. So even if somebody that's, th those people out there just wanting to steal things, they won't have that passion. They won't be that person to drive that through to something that works. That's probably much more important, isn't it, than trying to protect it and keep it into yourself. Yeah, well, I suppose you, you, you learn about, how, again, you know, as an entrepreneur, you will have to learn about how you partner and collaborate. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, it's inevitable for a small business. Um, so, um, you know, often in a situation, say, where we've got, you know, an entrepreneur who really has got a trust issue, you know, we'll probably put them in touch with a more experienced entrepreneur. Yeah. To kind of have that conversation with them. So it kind of counterbalances the horror stories that they have, they've heard about. You know, where you've actually seen sort of successful collaboration taking place, which has made a massive difference in terms of what a company has um, invented, what it's developed, or how it's taken it to market. Another aspect of this, I guess, is you'll have, we'll, we'll have people with a, a great idea. It's technically wonderful. Some people might expect that they're going to get, let's exaggerate, 99% of the profit that comes from that. But of course, they haven't got all the things they need to make it work commercially. So coming to a realistic view about what they might get back from this is probably part of that conversation, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, what do they say, with, for any um, drug that comes to market, it will have required about 100 different organisations through the innovation, through the development process to get it to market. Um, because there's a whole variety of different skill sets that are required for that. So I suppose if you take, you know, that, then the value that's created at the end is, you know, there's, there's a whole raft of organisations who will be taking a cut out of that value um, as part of that process. And so that's inevitable. And we always, you know, talk with companies saying, look, you know, what is it? Who is it that you need to be collaborating with in order to grow the size of the pie? It might reduce your share of the pie but if the pie is significantly bigger, then everybody benefits. And I don't have to hung up on, on how much of the, uh, of the profits you're retaining yourself. Look at the total profits that you're making. And if a collaboration grows the profits, then it's a collaboration that's probably worth doing. And I guess a significant part of what you do at Darsbury is introducing people that can be trusted. Because that's obvious. There are obviously some partners or potential partners pretending yeah. to to be trustworthy that are actually going to try and exploit your ideas. Yeah, and um, you know, you know, I don't say over 15 years, we, we have some horror stories. And you know, we've had situations where people have, we've made an introduction, the partnership has gone very sour. Uh, I mean, you know, and you do things with the, you know, the best intentions, you know, we're not there to kind of um, do due diligence on everybody that we introduce. And we certainly would be advising people, look, they take the right steps that, you know, they protect themselves appropriately. They have the right agreements in place. Uh, they have the right uh, IP protection in place where appropriate um, so that they go in with their eyes open. But of course, you know, if, if people do that once, their, their, their reputation is solid. You yeah. know, you don't, you don't introduce them to anybody else and you would warn others about engaging with them. So it becomes pretty quickly self-defeating. Absolutely. If it's all right with you, we've got a few minutes left. Can I ask about the wider uh, across the country? Because I think you're involved in not just Darsbury, but a little bit more. Yeah, so I'm a director of the UK Science Park Association. So that's an organisation that has about 100 and I think now 130, 140 um, either science park or innovation locations right the way across the UK from I think the, the furthest north is up in Oban in Scotland uh, to Catalyst in Northern Ireland down to Plymouth Science Park um, in the southwest um, 
Aberystwyth in Wales and, and, and across to a whole variety, not surprisingly, around sort of Cambridge and so on, a variety of science parks. Um, yeah, so, uh, and that's, and I suppose that for me was, that, that was another community I got involved in. I knew nothing about running a science park. Didn't even know what a science park was when I first took the job. So who was I going to learn from? Well, those people who were already running science parks and, and I was benefited by, uh, you know, being part of the UK Science Park Association where people were very open about sharing their experiences, their knowledge, their expertise, um, that basically you would just go and ask questions to anybody and, you know, they were happy to come back. It was kind of like our open source community in that sense. Um, there was, and, and I still use it today. In fact, I actually just put another question out to the community to say, well, okay, well, what are people doing in this area? Because why should I try and learn from scratch if somebody out there has, has already cracked it? Well, learn from them. Um, well, that was a very silly question for you. What is a science park? Is it, is it have to be part supported by the government to qualify, or can they be totally commercial? Or? Um, it, it, it doesn't have to be supported by the government. Um, there are now many commercially operated science parks. I guess it, it's a great question. John, because I'm sure if you asked a number of people who run science parks, you'd probably get slightly different versions. I suppose my version is that a science park tends to have a, a number of different uh, aspects to it. One is that there will be a focus on provide space, provide facilities to companies. So it is a physical home, if you like, for businesses. Uh, secondly, that it uh, there usually is a kind of um, a knowledge entity that is linked to it in some shape or form and that could be a university in our case it's SciTech Darsbury it's, it's Darsbury Laboratory um, for some science parks so like Alderley Park um, not far from, from, from Darsbury that's the link is to the AstraZeneca facilities and the AstraZeneca organization so it can it, it, but it, it can be different things but it tends to be that there's a kind of knowledge base a knowledge entity that has um, that can add value and expertise and capability to what's going on and I say you know the, the final aspect is kind of what we touched on we talked about earlier which is about a highly um, engaging business support environment so actually this is not just about being a landlord this is as much about being a business partner to the companies that come and locate on the science park so, so actually we are, we're, we're wanting to drive their growth their growth becomes our growth so do we get a different focus in some of them? Some of them specialise or? Yeah, they're, they're, I say elderly part is a classic example, of course, very highly focused around life sciences. Um, and you'll find a number of kind of science parks around the UK, which are focused around life sciences. The places like um, there's a technology park at Silverstone, which is not surprisingly heavily focused around kind of the automotive and engineering sectors more, more generally. Um, so often they are kind of, because of their, their particular locations, they will be responding to the strengths and the capabilities of their geography. Typically, 80% of the companies that locate on a science park will come from a 20 mile radius around that science park. So, it, you know, naturally they're going to kind of reflect what are the strengths of that particular geography. So they're about uh, local jobs as well, and that, that local community. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and drawing that local economy, absolutely. You know, I say, hence why for us, you know, we will look very closely about um, how can we help benefit the local community. Our, our borough council is one of our stakeholders. So this, the growth of Darsbury, we would want to see reflected in the growth of jobs for people who live in the local borough. And you said near the start that you're aiming for 10,000 people working there in the end. Correct. We've got yeah. a time scale, roughly. Uh, I mean, we've, it's always been probably over a 20 to 25 year time scale. I think, you know, when you're kind of looking that far out, it becomes pretty difficult to be that precise. You know, when I started out, you know, we've already had one major global financial crash and a, and a global pandemic. Those will have potentially some impact in terms of kind of how quickly things might happen. Not surprisingly. But it's a great thing to have though, what you're trying, what, well, what you are building and, and where it might go next, really exciting. Yeah, and, and I think it reflects that we talk about, for us, one of our key philosophies is home for life. So that's what we talk about. We want to do a journey with a company that they can join us when they are a starter and they might only need a hot desk. And actually they're still at SciTech Darsbury when they are a major international company and their headquarter building is at SciTech Darsbury. 
and they're employing several hundred people on the site and several thousand people around the world. That's for me as then I know that we've succeeded in, in our vision. That's a really important <sighs> point for me because if we go on the website, you can see these huge big buildings. It feels like it's big business, lots of things happening. But one of the key points there, you said you could actually have a hot desk, which means part time, one person. Yeah. So you really are starting at the the bottom level for somebody with an idea that wants to. Yeah. Yeah, and we always worked on the basis that in the in our early days, we were probably much more predominantly focused around working with startup and early stage SME companies. Um, you know, as long as we had a person to to work with we actually would take anybody, you know, no matter how crazy the idea might be, because our, our view was actually, there was a greater probability this would succeed if they were based at Scientific Data than if they were trying to do it on their own. And that, and, you know, and that was the philosophy. So actually, you know, we, we, and if they didn't make it, okay, that happens, you know, um, we weren't going to worry about our kind of statistics about, you know, failure rates or success rates. The key thing was actually about trying to improve the probability that a company would survive and thrive. And I think yeah, all that kind of stuff, obviously you're a lot bigger than potentialization at the moment. It's tiny, but our philosophy very much is about how do we help people yeah. reach their potential, make the best of their strengths. So in that sense, uh, feeds into perhaps some of the things that you would do in terms yeah. of networking. Yeah. Now, yeah. I think and, and I was going to say, because, you know, part of our philosophy is actually, in, in some cases, we're as much working with the entrepreneurs yeah. as, about helping them f fulfill their potential and the journey that they're on, you know, yeah. in some cases over many, many years. So in that case, it absolutely aligns with what potentialization is about. Now, I, I, I'm not sure if Darren waved a few minutes ago, because I know he's certainly, uh, his theory is all about how we grow and develop our psychologies actively. Uh, was he going to ask another question? I've probably had about 10 questions and forgotten them over the time. I can't get a word in, John. John. I know, we're so busy talking. So, no, so nothing I, right now? Uh, no, I had, I had um, collaborations. I had a question about how much does it cost for a desk? You know, literally just simple questions like that. But also, um, I, I actually thought about potentialization and having it as a, a you know, the way potentialization is being geared up and the way I'm gearing up my stuff. Um, I, I created a theory, John Leake, not Twig. I, I created a theory and people are picking it up and I've got people around the world using my theory. I need help to develop the idea, the, not the idea, the business. Right. Uh, the idea is set and I've got about three or four, you can't see them over there. Okay. But it's the business that needs help and it's that kind of, you know, that's, that's interesting. I've actually made a note to arrange a chat with John Leake. Right. I look forward to it, Darren. So yeah, so that, that kind of thing, because as you said, we can't know everything. I know what I know, and I know you know more than I do in the bit that I need. Great. Well, I'd be delighted to have that conversation, Darren. I say, you know, um, we always look, you know, we got a, a network of great people and, and I say people who are always ready and willing to give time. So if there's things that either we can help you with or actually there's somebody that we know that can help you with, then uh, hey, that's, that's what we're about. We've, we've covered quite a lot. Is, is there anything you'd like that you think we might have missed or have we covered pretty much what we want to today? Um, I suppose that the only one comment I, I probably didn't think, I, it was a question you'd asked about, you know, when does a collaboration break down? I suppose the, the other situation where a collaboration breaks down is when it feels unbalanced, mm. when it feels one-sided, when it feels that one partner is taking a lot and giving little. Um, and that, I suppose, is, is then that requires the, the partnership to be open and candid um, about kind of what the expectations are. Um, and uh, it requires then good collaborators will recognise when it has become unbalanced and when you've got a dissatisfied partner. Uh, a bad collaborator is one which just keeps taking until eventually the collaboration ends. Um, <laughs> And I guess that that's where the psychology comes in a little bit more, isn't it? Because the, the conversations that happen at the beginning of a collaboration in terms of actually we've got things on both sides that the one can use will be better and stronger together. When it starts to go wrong, especially if you're perhaps introvert or naturally wanting to be agreeable, 
these are going to be more challenging conversations about, hang on, how do we fix this? Or how do we break cleanly? Or, or what should happen next? So, yeah. yeah. So hopefully potentialization can help a little bit in some of those areas yeah. in the next few years. Well, I say, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that in terms of kind of what you're doing, we'll have, you know, great benefits to the individuals that are in these various companies across the site, because actually part of it, you know, very few people are born as an entrepreneur. So sometimes for a variety of reasons, they decide that they're going to take the plunge. Um, and their le the level of, of their preparedness to do that journey and what it requires from them personally, um, you know, varies massively. And so often actually we are helping individuals, you know, on that journey about how they need to develop their, their capabilities as that entrepreneur, uh, understand their kind of personal strengths, weaknesses, you know, areas that they need to kind of recognize in terms of the, the, the way that they behave, um, uh, the way that they will deal with people. Um, you know, all of those kind of personal skills, um, uh, interpersonal skills, emotional intelligence and so on are things that people are going to have to develop as part of being a good and uh, a successful entrepreneur. So I'm sure there's a whole load that you could help with in terms of kind of giving people greater insight into who, into who they are and, and, and how they need to develop those, their, their, their attributes. I think uh, this is the beginning of a, a much longer conversation and hopefully we can revisit this in a few months when we've got the service of potentialization running a little bit. And experience. Darren, sorry, you were going to say something, Darren? I said I have the data already on profiles. On Fantastic. On yeah. And I said to John earlier that and, you know, I think it would be anytime you're wanting to kind of pilot something and you want a bit of a, a ready group to test that out, then I'm sure we can get people on site. To, to get engaged with that. And I say, for me, it would be a great thing to be able to kind of showcase, um, you know, work, working with you and, and, and you kind of getting benefit from being part of that community, but also giving something back at the same time. That sounds like a perfect thing to close on. We really appreciate the offer. And obviously the, the, the years of your life that you've put into Darsbury and, and the amazing things you've done with it. So, and thank you very much for all no, the time No, it's an absolute tonight. pleasure. And, right. Uh, Yes.